Uh, I was going to say thanks for the invite to Katie and Steph. I've sort of forced myself onto the programme. Uh, very pleased to be here. I wanted to say a little bit about the event, just a few words if I can uh, before we start. So this is an event that's sponsored by the BSA Postgraduate Forum and by the University of Teesside Social Futures Institute, so uh, credit to them, thanks to them. Uh, when we getting these BSA events, are, it's a competitive process, and you have to sort of put in a bid to. And it was actually very. We learned a very competitive process, um, and we thought about the title and what we should have a project or an event about. Uh, we had various ideas, but we settled on this one about precarious places and precarious lives because it seemed to connect up with important questions of the day for politicians, for poli policy makers, for practitioners, uh, academics, and for people in general. And it also, we felt, right, yeah, and, and in terms of precarious places, I think we're looking at one when we look out the window. One of the things, nice things about working here, I don't know if you can see, there's a tower block there, Middlesbrough Tower. I used to teach my third year module on the top floor of that tower block. And one of the nice things would be be able to be talking to the sorts of students who were living lives that weren't a million miles from the sort of research that I did about a place from which they came and be able to sort of point to it out of the window that this is the place. Uh, so when people talk about research and teaching and synergies and all that malarkey, that was actually a felt experience for me. So it's quite nice to be talking about these issues in this place. Um, it's a lovely new building, isn't it? But the systems don't work quite right. So if you look out the back there, this is not all, this is all a preamble. I haven't started my talk yet, okay, it's all right. It's, you can see some like metal things sticking up, fancy metal things, gallows, what are they gallows? What we've got is a, a high-tech ecosystem for the, uh, <coughs> for the heating and ventilation, which is now being supplemented by some more fans. Um, and we haven't really tested it out yet, so uh, uh, we're now experiencing what it's like to actually have a, a classroom full of people uh, with this system that doesn't quite work, so we see. Um, but at least I've got one fan. So I want to reflect on 20 plus years of research with young people on Teesside that I've carried out with colleagues here from Teesside University to see what we can learn about transitions and precarity. And the simple message is a simple message. We can't understand people's <coughs> lives without understanding the social context and the social and economic landscapes in which those lives are made and framed. That's, um, I think that's Billingham. And um, my guess from looking at these young people, children and young people's outfits, that's early 70s. And that has some resonance for the time period and the place that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so I, one of my backgrounds, one of my areas is youth studies. And we're, all f we're always talking about new things, ruptures, breaks, post this, post this. I think we need to be a little bit careful and remember that some things that might appear to be new or novel or different or strange perhaps aren't completely so. So this is um, Lady Bell's famous study at the works, which is looking at iron steel works in, in Middlesbrough. We forget how terribly near the margin of disaster even the thrifty man walks, <coughs> who has in ordinary normal conditions but just enough to keep himself on. The possibility of being from one day to the other plunged into actual want that is always confronting his family. So that sense of labour precarity and the closeness of poverty, even for those in work, is an experience that Lady Bell was referring to back then and is something that will be I'll be talking about from the current recent period now. And I think it was Dave Byrne, it might not have been Dave Byrne, I think it possibly was, talked about how some of the forms of employment practice that we see now are actually reminiscent of early forms of capitalist development. A bit of history. Uh, Middlesbrough is a fascinating place. It's great to be able to talk about, talk to you about this fascinating place. 
in this fascinating place. If you know the answer, don't shout it out. Quiz question. So uh, that's Middlesbrough in about 1810. How many people lived in Middlesbrough in 1830? Uh, to give you a clue, there's about 140,000 in this town now. How many people lived in Middlesbrough in 1830? How many? That's quite a quiz. 1,400. 1,400. Higher, lower. Higher, <laughs> lower. So Middlesbrough in 1830 had a population of 30 people. Three zero. And there was nothing here really. It was a farm. Yeah. It gets its name because it's in the middle of, sort of in the middle, Whitby and Durham. So it was like a sort of small pilgrimage route. Which, and there was, there was an abbey here, Middlesbrough Abbey. doesn't exist anymore. And they discovered iron in the hills over there at Eston. And the place boomed. It became like the Klondike, people coming to work in the booming iron industry. It's the place which had the first passenger steam railway, stopped into Darlington. A fame that, uh, a place that by the end of the 19th century had got to about 90,000 people. Jude was making a point earlier about how, uh, when we talk about issues about immigration and identity and class, this is a place of immigrants. There wasn't anybody here <laughs> 200 years ago, particularly of, uh, of Scottish and Irish and, uh, immigrants and people from other parts of Yorkshire. It's a place that's famous, became famous for its industrial prowess. So when you go to San Francisco, like I had the joy to do that last autumn, you see the Golden Gate Bridge made of Middlesbrough steel. You see the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which they copied off Newcastle's bridge, obviously, also made of Middlesbrough steel. The Indian Railways, made of Middlesbrough steel, iron and steel. People talk about Teesside as being a policy laboratory or a research laboratory. So it sort of is those things, but I don't like this, the way that that sounds. It's a place that if you named a, a UK government policy initiative by its acronyms, <coughs> It's had it. I can't think of a one that's not been done on Middlesbrough on Teesside. Education Action Zone, Employment Zone, Enterprise Zone, Health Action Zone, Urban Development Corporation, Single Regeneration Budget. Um, there's others. Yeah. We've had the whole lot. And I think we're the only place that had the full hand of Action Zones at one time. <coughs> yeah, but this is the point that it tends to be less well known. It's about its prosperity. So in the mid-70s, South, South Tees sub-region was the third most prosperous sub-region in the UK, after London and Aberdeen. It was a place, I won't go into the technical way that that, that, that got estimated, but it was a place that was doing well, and was quite well off. To now, being you to use Dave Byrne again, to probably being the most deindustrialized or one of the most deindustrialized locales in the UK. And Middlesbrough often described as the poorest town in the UK. It's difficult to think of a place that's had such wide scale, rapid, deep social and economic change as has Middlesbrough in terms of its birth, growth, prosperity and then collapse, <coughs> or decline. It's a place in which I and others have done research. Uh, that's the first ever study I did here. 1991, he can't be that old, he is. 1991, uh, this is about uh, youth and the enterprise culture. We're sort of hearing this stuff again. People should set up their own business. There is a new enterprise allowance scheme, isn't there? Oof. That's the, f I think that's the first of probably the only study that was ever done on the original enterprise allowance scheme. So this is like, yeah, that was Thatcher's, yeah, so end of Thatcherism really, uh, and enterprise culture stuff, through to probably the most recent one, which is poverty and insecurity, like in low pay, no pay Britain. 
Um, and what I've tried to show with this slide is that we've not just done books and stuff, but we've tried also to disseminate more widely through media, uh, social media, traditional media. All these, I think all these, as the problem gets to my age, I can either have my glasses on and look at you, or, take, or not actually see what's on the screen. So, yeah, these are all, you know, Benefit Street and how the second series of Benefit Street was filmed in Stockton. Uh, uh, we wrote an article in a journal which, which uh, challenged the whole notion that there were such things as Benefit Street. That somehow, well, I know how I did, but we managed to get that into the press and it got a lot of publicity. And I think it's, yeah, that one there, Daily Star, probably my favourite, actually to get a piece in the Daily Star as a straight report, which doesn't rubbish us, <laughs> it rubbishes the programme, uh, was uh, something I was quite pleased with. So in, in, in short, this has been research funded by ESRC, JRF, in some of the poorest neighbourhoods in England. Uh, Two of the wards were in the top five most deprived of eight and a half thousand when we started doing research. The core sample is quite large for qualitative research. 186 white working class, so-called hard to reach young adults. <coughs> Our approach has been, well, we, we think it's in depth. I suppose that's for other people to judge. We, we, you know, to try to get close up to people's lives and get a wide ranging understanding of different aspects of their transitions. It's, these are, as you see, a long-term set of studies. We've, been able, we've, we've had the, uh, I don't know what the right word is. We've been lucky to be able to have this concerted investigation study, set of studies in this one place, pursuing related themes over time. And there is an element to the research which is longitudinal, in that some of the people that were in uh, these two studies, to this one of my collaborators on this project here. Uh, some of the people in those two studies were followed through to that study and then into that study. So from their late teens to their 30s, early 30s, so we get be able to get that long-term longitudinal view. What did we find? Okay, some findings, some general things we can say from all that research. So I'm probably important to, to mention school. It's a bit of a depressing story, a familiar story to anybody who's read anything about uh, the sociology of education, particularly working class young people. And I put Learning to Labour up by Paul Willis there because it's a very similar story. I can't, the, the sorts of words that are used to try to capture young people's experiences are those three Ds. Yes, there was disengagement, yes, there was disaffection, but probably most common was a a sense of disappointment expressed. And Anthony here, so Anthony, he's 23 when we interviewed him, he's looking back at his school years and I think he captures quite nicely what I mean by that. Our school didn't really do much homework or nothing, I found. I don't know, there was no encouragement there. I didn't feel it was anyway, I just, well I don't know, maybe if I don't know, I was in lower sets than a lot of people, so I just, I think maybe under that mark there didn't seem to be enough encouragement. Yeah? He's not really sure, but that's what it felt like to him. Uh, <coughs> that didn't set in stone negative attitudes to schooling and training, and people went back and re-engaged with courses, but we have to ask questions about the value of those courses. You will know, some of you will, about the Wolf Report and her, uh, her investigation into post-16 vocational education UK and how, in the UK and how much of it is vague, muddled and of little value. This is hard stuff. Young people are being deceived. The staple offer for between a quarter and a third of the post-16 cohort is a diet of low-level vocational qualifications, most of which have little to no labour market value. So when we do all our good work to try to tackle NEAT and get young people to re-engage with education, the successful outcome is to get young people to do the MBQ2s. Yeah, I think I'm right about that. The Wolf Report shows that many of those MBQ2s have no value. And I think this is, a po and this is one of the things that uh, Michael, my, uh, my little sticky label fell off. Get in your oh. thing. So, uh, 
I really think there's some serious questions that we need to ask. Oh, and in terms of your analysis, there's no mention explicitly of youth policy. I think we, we, we face an institutional crisis, which has many dimensions <coughs> to it, about what, what we are doing for and with and to young people. And just this bottom statistic about the rate of applications in Teesside for manufacturing and engineering apprenticeships is very revealing. Yeah? There, there are 28 applications for every available place on an apprenticeship. What did we find? Job insecurity, some of you have seen this slide before. Unsurprisingly, given the locale, given the nature of these people's backgrounds, unemployment was a common and recurrent experience for people. More surprising, perhaps, was that so was employment. So people moved in between jobs and unemployment and schemes and college. This was, the, this was an archetypical or the typical story. Leaving school, retraining scheme, unemployment, job, unemployment, FE, unemployment, job, new deal, unemployment, and so on and so on and so on. So a different story, Steph, to your description. It's important to say then that that pattern, tell, that pattern <laughs> itself is really important, it tells you something. So this isn't about permanent employment, nor is it a story about long-term unemployment. This is about something else. This is about people churning around in the labour market. So when Charles Murray labels Middlesbrough as a place where you'll find the welfare underclass, the new rubber welfare underclass, and he named it by name as a place you find it, this is, this is directly would contend with those sorts of ideas. You don't, <coughs> this is about people continually and repeatedly wanting to engage with the labour market, but the labour market being one which is typified by the insecurity of employment and chucking people back out again. And this was a pattern that lasted. These weren't stepping stones to something better. This wasn't just a youth experience. We also know from that book there that this pattern we describe of shuttling between low pay and no pay was something that was common to working class people of, who were older in the same localities. What did they do? They got jobs that were of these sort. They worked in bars and fast food restaurants, there were care assistants, there were security guards, janitors, shop workers, call centre workers, care assistants. These are the sorts of jobs that are really very important for the economy and for society. These are Generally speaking, the sort of jobs that aren't going to get offshored, but to which we give little value. This, would work, this was work that people were easily hired into and easily fired from. We interviewed employers as well in this book, and that was, that, that, that was quite revealing, the, you know, because you often hear about skill shortages and employers wanting to employ people with this skill, that skill, that qualification. No. Well, it depends what sort of employment what sector of the labour market you're talking about. The employers in this study talked about, the, well, so, so the uh, personnel manager for quite a large chain of supermarkets said, well, we look at CVs to be polite and people's qualifications, but we're not really looking for Oxford, you know. We just want people with the right attitude. Yeah? The right attitude was the phrase that employers continually used to capture what it was they were looking for when they were recruiting young adults. Right attitude being turn up, do the job, smile, and be prepared to work for low pay. <coughs> so, like a scientist, I've got an equation. Old class-based norms and practices about real work, people wanted jobs. If you put that in a context of massive local locally concentrated deindustrialization and the continued abundance of poor work at the bottom of the mar labor market and then add in as well welfare to work schemes which are all about moving people from unemployment to jobs and it doesn't matter what quality those jobs are and then now increasingly punitive welfare regimes which were, are, are about punishing and disciplining the unemployed what you get is what we found these poor transitions of low pay no pay of economic marginality, of people churning around at the bottom. And I think, just take a drink. <coughs> Putting it back into the historical context, we were recruiting, I can't help but look out the window since it really gives away where we did the research. These were people recruited from estates that were built 
for workers in ICI in British Steel. Yeah? So these, the, the, not the parents, but the grandparents of these people, these young people, were at the top of the working class. This was the labor aristocracy. They came from the labor aristocracy. Yeah? The male, well-paid, well-skilled, unionized, jobs for life, working class. But now uh, are in a position or have the sorts of lives so that people like Charles Murray can call them an underclass. Try to think about some bigger <laughs> questions and some putting this in some wider context. Uh, Patrick Ainley and Martin Allen have produced a lovely book which is called Running Up a Da it's convoluted metaphors. Running Up a Down Escalator in a Class Structure Gone Pear Shaped. That's what they call it. Yeah. We need to ask questions about what role we have for mass education. What's it for? What, what's this place for? What, what are we doing? In the 1980s, people critiqued YTS as basically as an, either a ware, warehousing function or an aging vat. Yeah? It, hide, it hid youth unemployment. Do universities do that now? Is that what mass education is doing? Is it true that this is a generation that is likely to face downward social mobility? The first generation, the first since the war that is going to do so. And if that's true, what does that mean for, for indi individual young people and for class divisions within youth? Is underemployment and precarity, can we understand these as generational experiences are no longer just restricted to the more disadvantaged working class young people of the sort that have been in our studies? How do welfare regimes of different sorts and old, old social divisions impact on, frame, <coughs> shape new conditions of precarity? These are all things that me, we colleagues here are interested in thinking about and researching now and to which I don't think there are any proper answers yet. Uh, I want to move on to talk about some of the some elements of that, though. I think I think this is what the orthodoxy is in terms of trying to explain youth unemployment at the moment. Yeah. So youth unemployment is an outcome of low aspiration and low skill. Yeah. There was a conference in this very building yesterday which had the title "Raising Aspirations for Young People in Care." I'm not going to say any more about it because I'll get into corporate difficulty. Just make that point. That's what I think that's what the common view is, yeah? That we need to tackle NEAT, that that's the main problem in youth policy, tackling NEAT. And we tackle NEAT by upskilling, by reintegrating young people into education. We raise the, particip the participation age to 18. Because the number of low-skilled jobs is, is going to decline drastically and we need more high-skilled workers for uh, either a current I'm not sure whether it's here or not, or a coming high skill information economy. This is what I call voodoo sociology. It's make believe. We know that the supply of better skilled workers has increased and is increasing markedly with the massive expansion of HE. But we haven't seen anything like an equivalent increase or demand for those workers. And this is something that um, Philip Brown, Hugh Lord, and David Ashton explore in the global auction and how the, the promise of higher education has been broken. Keep and Mayhew in their analysis and research say ups the upskilling strategy or this idea <coughs> ignores the scale and persistence of low, play, low paid employment within the UK economy. The numbers of jobs requiring little or no qualification appears to be growing rather than shrinking. So the Work Foundation and Citizens talk about the hourglass economy. We were hearing some of this this morning, about the hollowing out of the middle. Again, I think Teesside, Middlesbrough, provides probably a very good example of this. So here, in this context, underemployment, not just unemployment, but underemployment, becomes a very significant issue. I mean, we can think about underemployment in different ways. Yeah? Uh, as Steph was, was describing, talk about part-time, people who are doing part-time work, work but would prefer longer hours, People who are like in the no pay, no low pay, no pay cycle churning, I think that's a form of underemployment. But also overqualification, so people being 
possessing skills and qualifications which are higher than the level of the employment that they're in. Uh, so you, government stats, UK graduate underemployment 2013, said that even five years after graduating, five years after, 34% of graduates were in non-graduate jobs. Tees Valley Unlimited, the local LEP, local enterprise partnership, acknowledges that there is significant underemployment of well-qualified people in the Tees Valley, with science graduates, for instance, working as school lab technicians or in call centres. Ken Roberts, uh, Ken Roberts has been researching these sorts of questions I think for about 50 years now, astonishingly. Uh, he, he produced a fantastic book in 2009 called Youth in Transition, which uh, was looking at youth transitions in Western Europe and Eastern Europe using all sorts of different methods. Uh, uh, and he comes, one of the things that's nice about Ken, he comes to very clear, pithy, statement-like conclusions. He talks about how underemployment now is the new global normality for youth. And so when we think about issues about ambition and raising aspirations, raising aspirations, raise, young people today are excessively ambitious relative to the jobs that, that, that the economy offers. This is, there is an overall shortage of jobs, not least good jobs. These are the plain facts about current opportunity structures that need to be addressed. Remember this the next time you hear raising aspirations. Think about, think about issue, the, the rates of graduate unemployment and underemployment when people tell you that young people have got low aspirations. So there's another example. McDonald's, the fast food restaurant in 2011, it had a hiring day. It aimed to recruit 50,000 new workers in one day. They had a million applications. Yeah? They took on 62,000, and as one witch <coughs> made, uh, remarked at the time, it seemed to be harder to get a job in McDonald's than to get into Yale, yeah? in terms of rate ratio of applicants to posts. So, uh, to try to conclude, this is where I need to actually look at the notes here. What sense can we make of all this? Who's that? C. Wright Mills. Yeah, nice. So back to C. Wright Mills again. C. Wright Mills to the rescue. You, you will know this quote, I'm sure, but I'll, I'll just try to read it for a moment. When, in a city of 100,000 people, only one is unemployed, that is his personal trouble. And for its, for its relief, we properly look to the character of the individual, his skills and his immediate opportunities. Ignore the sexist language. But when, a nation, when in a nation of 50 million, 15 million people are unemployed or underemployed, that is an issue. That is an issue. And we may not hope to find its solution with the range of opportunities open to any one individual. The very structure of opportunities has collapsed. Both the correct statement of the problem and the range of possible solutions require us to consider the economic and political institutions of the society and not merely the personal situation and character of a scatter of individuals. <coughs> so we need to look at the way we can connect up private troubles and public issues. So to use his phrase, the correct statement of the problem, I think in trying to understand issues to do with youth unemployment and underemployment and precarity and youth transitions in Teesside, we have to ask the question, what has happened here? What has happened here? This is a place that was made and built for working class industry and was, became, you know, had global prowess for that. To use uh, the way that my colleague Colin Webster puts this, our interviewees were born between 1974 to the mid-80s on the cusp or in the depths of accelerated global, global local economic change. A region was wrecked, to use Ray, Hud Ray Hudson's title, a region was wrecked, shifting the economic crisis onto these individual life stories. This is what we must address then, the public issues of social structure, not the voodoo sociology of raising aspirations and so forth. So, and I think 
to use and coin, to rephrase uh, John Vi Wilson, Dave Byrne, a strong notion of social exclusion asks who or what has been doing the excluding. Just to finish, uh, I, I did have the title On the Road to Nowhere, so I'm trying to keep with that metaphor. Uh, and, and is precarity unbounded? Are we all in it together? Are all young people in the same position? Is everybody on this road to nowhere? I think this is an important empirical question to which we don't really know the answer completely. But I'm going to go back to, uh, this is from a review of, uh, that was published in 1907 of Lady Bell's At the Work. And the author of the review said this, and I think it's important to remember, the cardinal difference between the lot of the rich and the poor is that the former have more margin in which to remedy mistake and misfortune. The path that iron worker daily treads between running streams of fire is but an emblem of the road of life along which he must walk. If he should stumble, actually, actually or metaphorically, he, as he goes, he has but a small margin in which to recover himself. Thank you.